In the remote reaches of the Appalachian Mountains lies a cave known only to a few seasoned cavers. It had no official name, just whispered rumors among the local adventurers. They called it the Devil's Throat, but what started as a daring adventure for four friends would soon turn into an unimaginable tragedy. Four lifelong friends set out to conquer the Devil's Throat. Leading the group was Jonathan John Mallory, a 32-year-old geologist who had spent years mapping caves across the country. Beside him was his best friend Peter Lawson, joined by Jensen Hart and Kevin Lazaro. They had heard stories of the cave's treacherous nature, but were not that concerned. After asking the route from the locals, they made their way towards the cave. The sun was just beginning to rise when they reached the cave's entrance. They geared up, each wearing headlamps, harnesses, and packs filled with supplies, before descending into the devil's throat. They navigated the tight passages and steep drops, but as they ventured deeper, the cave began to reveal its true nature. The passages grew narrower, and the rock surface was filled with moisture. The adventure became an uneasy tension as the cave seemed to close in around them. After a long descent, they reached a narrow passage that John believed would lead to a deeper chamber. The passage was tight, barely wide enough for a person to squeeze through and angled sharply downward. John went first, wriggling through the constricting space. Peter followed, then Jensen, with Kevin bringing up the rear. About halfway through the passage, their worst nightmare happened. John had made it through, but Peter, who was right behind him, suddenly let out a gasp of pain. The narrow passage had taken an unexpected twist, and Peter had gotten stuck in a tilted position, his body wedged between two sharp rocks. His legs were twisted awkwardly beneath him, and his torso was contorted, pressing painfully against the unyielding stone. At first, Peter tried to move, to twist his body free, but every attempt sent searing pain through his back and legs. He could feel the sharp edges of the rocks digging into his flesh, the pressure growing unbearable. The narrow passage offered no room to maneuver, and every movement seemed to wedge him in tighter. The pain was excruciating like knives stabbing into his lower back and legs. John, realizing something was wrong, called back to Peter. The response was a cry of pain. John immediately crawled back toward the narrow passage, trying to reach his friend, but the confined space made it impossible to help. Jensen and Kevin, still behind Peter, were equally helpless. The walls of the passage pressed in from all sides, making it impossible for them to assist. The group was trapped. Peter pinned and John stuck behind him, unable to push forward or retreat. The reality of their situation began to sink in. There was no quick way out, no immediate help on the horizon. Kevin and Jensen finally decide to get help before it gets too late, leaving John and Peter behind. They made it to the surface, their minds racing as they considered their options. They were miles from the nearest town, and any official rescue team would take hours, if not days, to reach them. They knew they couldn't wait. Jensen and Kevin ran through the forest in sight of the locals who well knew the mountains and their secrets. They explained to the locals about their dire situation which needed an immediate plan of action. The locals decided to divide into two groups, one that had get in contact with the rescue teams while the other composed of self-taught skilled cavers who would try to get Peter and John out. They gathered tools and rushed towards the cave and made the descent. By the time they reached the narrow passage, Peter was in a state of agony. Locals assessed the situation and realized Peter's body was wedged so tightly that any attempt to free him could cause further injury, or worse. They tried everything, chipping away at the rock using makeshift levers to create space, but nothing worked. Eventually, Peter's strength began to fade and he gave in. The rescue teams eventually did arrive, but it was too late. It took them nearly a full day to extract Peter's body from the cave. On October 17, 1991, four seasoned cavers, Rick Black, Chris Zimmerman, Hugo Mulek, and Ron Lassell, stood at the brink of this abyss, readying themselves for an airlift to the cave's foreboding entrance. Rick, Chris, and Hugo were rangers at Mount Robson Provincial Park, their expertise matched by Ron's deep experience in caving. Together, they formed a formidable team, prepared to conquer the cave's many challenges. Once airlifted to the site, they swiftly established a base camp and split into two groups. Rick and Chris would enter the cave first, with Ron and Hugo following three hours later. As they ventured deeper into the earth, the team descended to a depth of approximately 1,300 feet, 400 meters, by 11.30 p.m. It was here they encountered the Refresher, 
a harrowing 29-foot, 9-meter vertical drop through a bone-chilling waterfall that drenched anyone who dared to rappel down. One by one, they descended until it was Rick's turn. But disaster struck. Unbeknownst to them, the rope was anchored to a 400-kilogram boulder instead of solid bedrock. As Rick began his descent, the boulder dislodged, crashing down and crushing his pelvis, leaving him unconscious and gravely injured. The remaining cavers rushed to Rick's side, relieved to find him alive but in excruciating pain. With his pelvis likely shattered and other injuries undetermined, Rick was immobilized. The team, skilled in first aid, quickly realized that Rick needed professional medical attention. They were faced with a grim choice, attempt to carry Rick out or leave him behind to summon help. A failed attempt to move Rick convinced them of the harsh reality. They had no choice but to split up. Chris stayed with Rick while Hugo and Ron embarked on an arduous journey to find help. Their mission was daunting. With no means to contact their helicopter pilot and a malfunctioning emergency radio, Hugo and Ron had to claw their way out of the cave and then trek 20 kilometers through dense wilderness to the highway. It took nearly five grueling hours to reach the cave entrance and another 14 exhausting hours to navigate the forest to the road. Meanwhile, deep within the cave's icy depths, Chris stayed by Rick's side, doing everything he could to keep him warm in the pitch-black freezing chamber. The two men turned off their headlamps to conserve battery power, huddling together as the frigid darkness closed in around them. By October 18th, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, had launched a massive rescue operation. Three planes were dispatched to gather specialized caving rescuers from Vancouver Island, and recreational cavers from across the region rushed to assist. By the morning of October 19th, nearly 36 hours after the incident, the first wave of rescuers was airlifted to the cave's vicinity, while others established a command center in the valley below. Unaware of the feverish activity above, Rick and Chris endured their ordeal. As hours turned to days, their situation grew more desperate. Rick, in immense pain, urged Chris to leave him and save himself, knowing that staying together would likely doom them both. With a heavy heart, Chris agreed, vowing to return with help. As he made his way out, he encountered the first rescuers, providing them with crucial information about Rick's condition before finally emerging into the daylight. Chris was immediately treated for hypothermia and airlifted to a hospital. Tragically, by the time rescuers reached Rick with medical supplies, it was too late. He had passed away shortly before their arrival. The news devastated the rescue team, many of whom knew Rick personally. The mission then shifted from rescue to recovery, and it took two more days to retrieve Rick's body from the cave's icy depths. An autopsy later revealed that Rick's injuries were fatal from the moment the boulder fell. The catastrophic damage to his body, including severe trauma to multiple major organs, meant that not even immediate hospital care could have saved him. Contrary to what many rescuers believed, it was Rick's devastating injuries, not hypothermia, that claimed his life. The attempt to save Rick Black remains the most extensive cave rescue operation in Canadian history, a haunting reminder of the perils that lurk in the depths of the earth. The children from the Methodist foster home planned a bus trip to a nearby village on October 5, 1965. However, the journey took an unexpected turn when the bus suffered a flat tire, diverting them to the Wildcat Cave instead. Morris Battelle and his friends, thrilled by the impromptu adventure, eagerly seized the opportunity to explore the cave openly this time. But as they ventured further, Morris got separated from his friends in the maze-like passages. Panic set in as he realized he was alone. He called out, but his voice echoed into silence. Desperate for help, he tried to find his way back to the entrance. He again called out for anyone else to come find him, but there was still silence. He was far too deep into the cave now. Morris was in a state of panic and agony as he navigated the treacherous terrain, trying to make his way back to the cave exit. His friends, who had already left the cave, thought he had exited before them and didn't realize he was still inside. But Morris was far from safe. He knew shouting for help was futile, so he focused on getting out alive. As he turned a corner, he realized he had taken a wrong turn and was now heading down a slippery passage that was getting narrower by the second. The walls were closing in, and he saw a small crevice with massive boulders on either side. To escape, he had to squeeze through the tiny opening head first. Taking a deep breath, he pushed himself through the narrow, slippery crack. This was the most challenging thing he had ever done in his life. 
As he wiggled his way through, one of the boulders suddenly shifted, trapping him between the wall and the rock. Morris was stuck, and his situation had just become even more dire. Morris froze, his mind reeling from the close call. He had almost gotten stuck, and the realization sent a chill down his spine. He knew he had to be more cautious as one misstep could lead to disaster. Panic and fear resurfaced in his eyes, and he could only hope that he was heading in the right direction. But fate had other plans. As he moved forward, the boulder shifted again, and Morris's worst fear became a reality. He was stuck, and the weight of the rocks pressed against his body, making it hard to breathe. He tried to free himself, but his efforts only made him more wedged. Eventually, he became completely lodged, unable to move anything except his feet, which protruded from the passage. The boulders were pressing against his body, and pretty soon it began to hurt. He was in so much pain, and because breathing was getting difficult, he had to take deep, sharp breaths. Knowing that his legs were free behind him, he tried to somehow pull himself out. The harder he tried, the more he realized it was impossible to get himself out of there. He was completely helpless, blaming himself for being stupid enough to get in this situation. After an hour, Morris's friends realized he was missing and told their teacher, William Powell. Powell, being smaller than Morris, entered the cave with two boys to search for him. They finally found Morris after a few minutes, and Pal tried to calm him down, telling him he would be okay. But Morris was struggling to speak, and only his feet were visible from the narrow hole he was stuck in. Pal tried to rescue Morris by using his belt to pull him out. He tied it on Morris's leg and started pulling. Considering it was a slippery area, he thought the force would slip him out. But the belt snapped, causing Morris's slip in the narrow passage even further and his face to hit the rock and resulting in a painful cut. This made the situation even more dire. Realizing traditional methods wouldn't work, Pal called professional rescuers for help. Fire Chief Paul Codera led a team to the cave, but they couldn't extract Morris using hooks, which was their initial plan that failed. The situation was becoming increasingly desperate. Firefighters set up a portable generator to light the cave and piped oxygen to Morris. They thought carefully about how to free him, but drilling into the rock could cause a cave-in, and using dynamite was not an option. They were running out of time. As the situation dragged on into the night, hopes began to fade. Morris was barely conscious, and the news of the trapped boy spread quickly across the country, making front-page headlines and featuring on national television programs. Radio broadcasts asked for help from small people, and many responded. Evelyn Pinky Petit, a nurse from Akron with a 5'2 feet stature, drove to the cave and managed to wriggle into the passage, comforting Morris for nearly three hours. Another experienced cave explorer, Terry Brown, set up a makeshift pulley system in order to get him out, but despite the efforts, Morris only moved a few inches. As the minutes turned into hours and the day turned into a cold, freezing night, the rescue attempts were becoming increasingly desperate. Morris was struggling to stay alive, and time was running out. The next morning, rescuers were still searching for small volunteers to help save Morris, but no one was small enough or strong enough to reach him. Morris had gone 24 hours without food or water, and he was starting to lose hope. Just when all seemed lost, a brave young boy named Michael Yid, an Eagle Scout, stepped forward to save Morris. A new plan was devised. They would put loops of rope around Morris, make him slippery with a glycerin solution, and lift him out on a support board. It was a risky plan, but it was their only hope. Yid crawled into the cave until he reached Morris's legs, which were sticking out of the narrow passage. No one else had gotten this close before. Yid tied ropes around Morris's ankles, legs, and body, and began to pull with all his might. They struggled to pull him out of the crack, and just when they thought they had him, Morris slipped and fell back into the passage. He was starting to think he would never make it out alive. Rescuers were desperate to keep Morris optimistic, knowing that if he passed out, they wouldn't be able to get him out. Morris slipped a few more times, and it seemed like all hope was lost. Finally, with firm tugging from above, he broke free. Cheers erupted as Morris was wrapped in a blanket and lifted out of the passage, more than 24 hours of being stuck. After a harrowing rescue, Morris was finally freed from the cave and taken to the hospital where he was treated for exhaustion, 
cuts, bruises, and a facial bruise. The incident could have ended in tragedy, but a lucky twist of fate saved him. As a precaution, the cave was sealed shut to prevent future accidents.